Okay, so this week we have reached um, in our study of the first book of John, chapter 2, verses 24 to 27. And this is what it says. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Well, as you can see, our passage this morning starts with the instruction, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. So what did the readers of John's letter hear from the beginning? Well, no prizes for guessing that we need to go back to the beginning of John's letter to find the answer to that question. So if we have a look at 1 John chapter 1 and verses 5 to 7, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. The key line here is the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. This is the message of salvation, that the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. And this is the same message which we heard from the beginning of our Christian walk. It's accepting this message which marks the beginning of our walk with Jesus, of our new life with him. We may have been seeking for some time leading up to that moment, and we may have heard all manner of things about Jesus, but the point at which we hear and accept the message that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, is the beginning of our new life. This is the message that we and the readers of John's letter heard at the beginning. The message of salvation doesn't change over time. It was the same then, it's the same now, 2,000 years later, and it will be the same for the whole of time. However, we have to accept that the idea of blood washing us clean is a very strange concept. It's not really going to be your opening gambit when you come to sh share the gospel with somebody. So here it's important to recall one of the verses from last week's study, which is 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. So John is able to use mature Christian language because he's addressing people who already know the truth. But we need to be careful when we speak, because mature language is meaningless to immature ears. Indeed, immature ears will turn away from mature language and seek out a language which they can understand. And who do you suppose is waiting in the wings to provide that easy to understand language? False teachers, or as Reg taught us last week, Antichrist. It's vitally important that that which you heard from the beginning is properly grounded in the truth. That's why mature Christians have a critical role to play in discipling new Christians. When Jesus delivered the Great Commission recorded at the end of Matthew, he instructed us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice it doesn't say go and make converts. It says go therefore and make disciples. We can't do the converting. This can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit through the living word of God. 
Romans 1 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes whilst bringing the gospel message to the unsaved is vitally important Jesus used some of his last words on earth to instruct us to make disciples of all nations obviously someone has to be saved first before they can be discipled so the importance of salvation is implied within this instruction but sometimes we can be so caught up in celebrating the excitement of someone's salvation that we forget how important it is to ensure that they are discipled why is it so important when we spend time in the new testament we can see how much of it is devoted to warning new Christians of the dangers of false teaching. Many of Paul's letters are written to counteract false teaching. Colossians is a good example of this. The people of Colossae were faced with a false teaching which said that Christ was not enough for salvation, that they needed Christ plus something else. So Paul dedicated his letter to reminding them what they heard in the beginning, i.e. the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Nothing more, nothing less, just Jesus. At a time when Christianity was in its infancy, and therefore all Christians were immature, false teachers were everywhere, preying on the vulnerable. It's still the same today. That's why when someone makes a profession of faith and declares Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, we, the church, have a responsibility to disciple them and ensure that they are fed the truth. And do you remember one of the things that Reg said last week? That the church is destroyed from within. The false teachers masquerade as fellow Christians and are very persuasive with their clever arguments. So protect yourselves by holding on to what you heard from the beginning, that the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And make sure that this truth abides in you. If this truth is living within you, you are protected from falling prey to false teaching. But notice that the word has to be living, not lying dormant. It must be active, breathing, growing. If it's dormant, it's likely to be snatched away like the seed which fell on the stony ground in the parable of the sower. How do you ensure that the seed is living? It needs to be nurtured, watered, fed, protected from frost, protected from weeds. This is discipling. As I've been talking about discipling, what's been going through your mind? Perhaps the need for you to be discipling others. Good, I sincerely hope it has. But what about your need to be discipled by others? However mature in the faith we might be, there's always a risk of complacency. And with that comes the risk of allowing false teachers to get a foothold in our lives. Don't forget that in the parable of the sower, some of the seeds began to grow, but were eventually strangled by the weeds which grew up amongst them. This is a metaphor for the false teachers which exist amongst us and can strangle the life out of us. If the ground had been cleared of weeds, the seed would have survived. In the same way, we need to ensure that we are being discipled so that our environment is being cleared of false teaching. If we consider ourselves mature and are discipling others, we need to make sure that we are not being subjected to false teaching which we then pass on to others. We should test everything against scripture to ensure that it is true and from God. 
in 1 John 4 verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Acts 17, 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. If all this sounds a bit troubling, don't worry. Look at the next sentence of our passage, which says, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. What a promise that is. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. How amazing is that? We can live in the Son and in the Father. Where could we possibly get any better protection from false prophets than that? We heard earlier when Joyce brought us the reading from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And verses 9 to 11. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Here the psalmist is talking about our spirit. Although our bodies might come under attack, our spirit will be protected by the Lord Most High when we abide in the Son and in the Father. And how do we abide in the Son and in the Father? If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. So hold fast to the truth which carried the gift of salvation to you, the truth that the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin, and we will abide in the Son and in the Father, where we will be protected so that no evil shall be allowed to befall you. And he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And having rejoiced in this amazing promise that we can abide in the Son and in the Father, we might be fully satisfied. But there's even more to come. The passage continues, and this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. When the scripture refers to eternal life, it's referring to life after death. A time when our salvation will be made complete and we will be reconciled with God. The idea of living forever is a concept much explored in legend and mythology in novels and films, etc. But this is something much different from the promise of eternal life that we find in the Bible. The fictional living forever of mythology never ends well. And despite all the promise and hope, always results in a life of misery. And often the hero granted eternal life spends all his time searching for death. The biblical eternal life is something much different. The concept of the passing of time will be gone. Time will no longer exist. When we try to get our heads around eternity, it's impossible to imagine how time can stretch all the way back to infinity and all the way forward to infinity. So it's really helpful if we can realize that time was created when God created the world. Let's just have a look at Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Time is defined by the passing of days measured by the rising and setting of the sun. 
So time was created when the, with the creation of the sun and the moon. Before the sun and moon were created, there was no time. When Jesus returns and the new heaven and the new earth come into being, we're told in Revelation 21, and I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light and the lamp is its lamp. So there will be no moon, there will be no sun, and therefore no more measuring of time, no more passing of time. Eternity is a constant state in which we will forever be in the presence of our loving Heavenly Father. And then the next verse in our passage says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. We spent quite a lot of time over the last few weeks considering those who are trying to deceive you. Three weeks ago, Malcolm warned us about those who seek to deceive us by watering down the message to give us a liberalized version of scripture designed to be palatable to the world. Two weeks ago, I warned you about being deceived into thinking that you are a Christian when you may not be. Last week, Reg warned us about the many forms taken by the Antichrists and the evil ways in which Satan seeks to deceive us. I don't intend to dwell any longer on this topic as it's been well covered now, but suffice to say that we need to heed the warning in 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the pup, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So this morning, I'd prefer to concentrate on God's promise that we can abide in him. The ultimate and only protection from the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So let's move on to verse 27 but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. This morning's passage started with, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. And now we have, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. It's no coincidence that John uses the phrase abide in you for both these occasions. As we've already learned, what you heard from the beginning is the gospel message of salvation. And when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit, which comes and lives in us. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Ezekiel 36.27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The anointing that you receive is the Holy Spirit. In John's Gospel, we read this, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So we've been anointed by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit abides in us. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do when he abides in us is teach us all things and bring to our remembrance all that I have said to you. That phrase, all that I have said to you, refers to the teachings of Jesus, the living word. When the Holy Spirit abides within us, he will bring to our remembrance the words of scripture. But that word remembrance is so important. To remember something, you must have heard it before. We can't remember something which we've never heard before. In the scripture on the screen there, John 14, 26, Jesus promises his disciples that the Holy Spirit will help them to remember everything he said. They had already heard it once from the very mouth of Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit would ensure that they remember it. This promise extends to us too. 
But the Holy Spirit can only help us to remember something if we've already heard it or read it before. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that we read the Bible and fill ourselves with the Word so that it is in us for the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance. And with this power of recollection comes the gift of teaching. The Holy Spirit also teaches through the power of the word. As our passage goes on to say, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie. The teaching of the Holy Spirit is true and is no lie. This is in direct contrast to the teaching of the false teachers, those who are trying to deceive you. If we want to know the truth, we must listen to the teaching of the Holy Spirit who abides in us. He will bring to our remembrance the word of God. The word against which we should test everything we hear. To test if it is the truth or another deception from false teachers. And finally, John finishes this section of his teaching with a call to abide in him, that is, the Holy Spirit. In this short passage, we get a beautiful picture of the Trinity all working in perfect harmony so that we may abide in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And that which we heard in the beginning is the gospel message. And when we hear it and truly believe in Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, then the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us and we will abide in him as well as in the Son and the Father. We will abide in Father, Son and Holy Spirit where no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Amen.